Our next speaker this afternoon is Travis Holland. Travis Holland with MHA Energy. He's worked there for a number of years. Uh, we've worked together on a number of different things over the years and uh, is, uh, is here to share some of his insights in working in the uh, the pipeline industry there on the MHA Nation. So that okay. over to Travis. All right. Well, um, we got some Dickinson State students. Maybe not. Maybe not. Okay, there's a few of you. So my mom, when I was a kid, that's where my dad met my mom, was at Dickinson State. And uh, he thought I was pretty cool because the first words I said to him was like four is, I'll fight you. So, but I've kind of kept that mentality. But my mom, um, she's sort of a legend in the tribal sector. Uh, Dickinson State has their, I don't know what they call it, ring of honor or something, you know, like their hall of fame. When the insurrectionists were at Nancy Pelosi's desk, and I'm kind of an anarchist. I, I like chaos sometimes. I make fun of Trump. I make fun of Biden. I voted for Morgan Freeman. So the guys like this at Pelosi's desk, and I'm laughing, and then somebody pointed out the folder next to his feet had my mom's name on it, Alice Spotted Bear, because one of the few things Congress did do unanimously was pass a Native American child care bill in her name. So I thought that was pretty cool because they can't be unified in anything, but they did do that with her. And with that said, she said I should always start a meeting with a joke. Most of my jokes are a little off color. So I, I made up a moderate one today. This is me. So I discovered this year that Mother Nature is going through menopause because she's been having hot flashes every month. So I rode in December on my motorcycle. I rode in January on my motorcycle. I rode yesterday in my motorcycle. You know, yesterday, 55 out, I'm cruising. Today, 18 below zero. So uh, I guess what we're going on to is this. Uh, my other joke is... If you don't think he looks good, move to the back of the room. I look better at a distance. But um, I worked at Dakota Gasification for about 30 years. And I, I had a wealth of experience, not by choice, just getting moved around. And in 2014, when the Bach and Boom came into play, the state, the tribe, we were being overwhelmed with uh, pipeline releases in a large part due to this product right here. This is made out of fiberglass. And industry, once they built something, you know, they built it cheaper because they're trying to save money, they, are, they try to salvage it and they make excuses and well, we'll do this, we'll do that. It's never gonna happen anywhere else. And it kept happening. So I also did another presentation, did the same presentation basically, but I changed the terminology. I called it, what are the odds a million to none. So when the tribe allowed me to come in and regulate this, they, they sort of recruited it or recruited me for this. We took 1.3 million gallons spilled down to zero. And we've maintained that. So I've had conversations with the head of FIMSA, Alan Mayberry. At that time, they weren't regulating gathering lines. They said it can't be done. I said, I've done it. And I said, if I can do it, you can do it. But the problem with then, and we get back into politics, with our tribe, we don't have Republicans, we don't have Democrats. We've got seven people looking after the interest of 17,000 people. So when I come up with an answer for better quality, to our, our thinking is we don't want to remediate, we want to prevent. So when I come up with these standards, they support me. And, and it's really blown my mind, you know, as to how well we've succeeded in this. The, the problem I have right now, most of you are way too young to remember this, but there used to be a commercial with the Maytag repairman. He just had nothing to do. And, and once we got to that point from spill, 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 spills, the tranquility, now it gets a little difficult. So I got to come and speak to justify my job. But, um, uh, yeah, so we, we had uh, a lot of interesting things happen. Like I said, uh, first few years were insane. We, we can go to the next one. Now I can't even see that. Ugh. 
So we'll go to this next question here as well. I'm not anti-pipeline. I'm responsible pipeline. So when I was in the other job, you know, I, I wanted it built responsibly, but I wanted it built. So I'm not opposed to pipelines, even though I have opposed pipelines. I simply demand that they be built responsibly. Because uh, when the DAPL issue was going on, I was joking. So with tribal people, it's called when you're a native, but you do things on a white perspective, that viewpoint, you're called an apple. I jokingly called myself the DAPL apple because I was the one native that was supporting DAPL. And it was because, not because of human rights violations, I'll never agree to that, but the fact that I knew it was going to save lives. And in a five-year span after it was put in play, the, the stats show it. Within Fort Berthold and the neighboring Bakken counties, it saved 20 lives a year, 100 lives saved. Nobody talks about it. But you need responsible infrastructure. And a lot of you... If you're in that area, you'll see it. You know, those, those trucks are no longer overwhelming. You know, it's, it's moderation, and we can live with that. But we couldn't live with it before. Everybody I knew cried. You know, we all lost somebody we loved. I had friends who lost their kids in car accidents. It was just insane. We were crying all the time. And the change it's made by having proper infrastructure is, is night and day. But again, the key is responsible, prudent pipelines. So you also have to be prepared for incidents afterwards. And uh, that was one of the things that was amazing when you'd see those emergency responders before. Through the trial and error of having to deal with incidents, they became exceptional. So we had some of the best emergency responders in the nation. I was a very good emergency responder. That's what I used to do. And mostly it's because I kept calm during emergencies. I, I'd see other people. So I was an EMT for 23 years, industrial firefighter for 25, hazmat instructor. But uh, when I saw those guys work as a cohesive unit, it, it was amazing. I'm glad I don't have to see it anymore. But when I witnessed it, the, you know, that Watford City area, Mandarin, Newtown, those guys were um, amazing as to how smooth they were. But that leads this to preparation. You, even though you don't know what's going to happen, when you do training, a lot of times people do it and they're doing it with the perspective that everything's going according to plans. When something goes wrong, chaos takes over. And you have to be a little more. That's why I didn't prepare for the speech. I, I had no clue. So I was like, well, I'll get up there. I've worked 40 years in this. I should be able to talk for 40 minutes. You know, just, just one minute a year. That's all I need. And I'm still only 49, just so you guys know that. So you want to establish responsible regulations to prevent occurrences. Under Article 3 of our tribal constitution, we have the right to set our own safety standards, especially when they're not being met at other levels. And that's how we did this. And like I said, uh, the support of the council, you know, backing me and what I wanted. And, and I wanted pipelines. Again, I just wanted them built well. And they always tell you, no, oh, we can't do that. We can't do that until you tell them no. And it's like, yeah, we can do that. So let's go ahead and go to the next one. This is what I was telling you about. So when we didn't have pipelines, when we didn't have DAPL, this happened far, far too often. So you had, uh, I think, two cars, four people, severely injured in this. There might have been fatalities. There was at least two helicopters coming in there. But the way those guys worked together, those emergency responders, was just absolutely amazing. And uh, in 25 years of dealing with that stuff, I never saw a better execution. And uh, I was really proud of those guys, and I'm glad I don't have to see that stuff anymore. Okay, we can go to the next one. So I'll get you back into my starting point. Um. One of the things we insisted on, in addition to having the right pipe material, is having leak detection. And I, I think one of the landowners talked about it, you know, most people didn't know, even though they're in positions of authority, they didn't know the industry, they didn't know the ins and outs and the technicalities. Even my engineer, he's a 30-year senior engineer, 
he never worked with this stuff. He knew of it, but he didn't understand it completely when it came to detection. So the very first meeting I sat down on in this position, and it was a group that had a huge bill, and you had higher ups from EPA, the BIA, other agencies. And I asked a very simple question. I said, uh, why didn't you have leak detection? And they said, you can't have leak detection with liquids, only gases, because they're compressible. And I said, you know, that's not true. I said, that technology was available 30 years ago when I started. I guarantee you, you have access to that today. And then they go, yeah, that's true. And all these head honchos started looking at each other like they're lying to us. And then they went on to the next one, and they tried to say a pressure differential system was a leak detection system. I said, no, it's not. It's for measuring dirty sock screens and filters. You could have used it as such if you'd gauged upstream and downstream and realized it was tripping off of zero back pressure. And they once again admitted, I, you know, I was telling the truth. And at that point in time, I always tell my kids, don't worry about what you want to be when you grow up. I never knew what I wanted to be till I was 50. And at that point in time, I knew exactly what I wanted to be because it, it was so easy because other people didn't understand it and they really couldn't BS me like they were getting away with with other people. So when I get to this thing, uh, another situation was they would try to mislead and they said they had a WinCo system for SCADA. And, and SCADA is basically telling you, you instantaneously when something goes wrong and if you have an issue. And I said, a WinCo system is not a SCADA system. It's a recording system, a 24-hour recording system. So after 24 hours, you know you're missing a million gallons. That's too late. You know, you have to be instantaneous on responses. Keep the releases to a bare minimum. And one of the issues we also had was power, you know, and that's why they would say they didn't have that. So we came up with a requirement for windmill with solar powered, you know, backup. So they would have power to run their SCADA systems, no matter how remote. And this is another one with chaos. So it is 25 below zero. That's a produced water sign and that's open water right in the produce water sign. So that's an absolute, there, there's no doubt whatsoever that is a produce water spill. But we go through the routine and uh, you know we sampled it, sent it off. The group was really good. They reported it themselves, even though their system didn't show any problems. They shut their system in. We had an old school uh, field you know, inspector and yeah, that's salt water. That's salt water. So we sent the sample in. It comes back is that was basically salinity from an agricultural field, a.k.a. cow urine. So I don't recommend testing, you know, salt water like that. And it ended up being a natural spring. But because the right of way is disturbed soil, that's always going to be the weakest link. So when it you know, permeated underneath the, the frozen ground, that was the easiest spot and it popped up right there. But I mean, nobody, not one of us thought anything other than an absolute produced water spill, but you just never know. So you need to verify. Let me go to the next one. So here's another one. We have a pipeline on this bridge and everybody said nothing can happen with a pipeline on a bridge. There's nothing can do any damage. And I always said, any above ground structure, you is, there's a risk associated with them. I said it could be a tornado. So this is after a fishing tournament. I, I think I was leading it on big fish maybe at the time. I can't remember. But uh, all of a sudden a tornado comes in. You know, it was just a tailwinds, but one person crapped themselves, I guarantee you, because they were crossing the bridge with their, you know, one ton truck, had a camper and then a boat on the backside. The camper actually got blown halfway off the bridge, but the boat and the pickup anchored it so the whole thing didn't go off. But I can't imagine how scary that is when you're pulling a camper and you see it in your rear view, half of it's hanging off the bridge. But uh, that's actually happened twice now. The, the second time a friend of mine was on the bridge and his pickup was lifting and it was snapping off the light poles on the bridge. And that group, again, most of these pipeline groups have been really good to work with, not all but most of them have been very good to work with. And uh, I told them about it and they 
inspected their support structures to make sure the integrity and everything was good on that. And it turned out to be okay. But what we did and where we've stood on this is HDD boring. So we don't want anything crossing over the lake. We don't want anything trenched into the lake. HDD boring came about in 2008. And there's never been a case of an HDD bore failure into a water source. When they build it, sometimes they can frack out and they can miss it. But you're talking bentonite, same material, clay base they use in drinking water systems. Aesthetically, it's not good, but it's not doing harmful damage to you know, the environment. So what we've been pushing for, and this is where I've successfully opposed pipelines in the past, You've got obsolete pipelines upstream of us. We have inherent water rights with our reservation from when they flooded it. So we have water rights downstream within our boundaries and upstream. And I've pushed and the tribe supported me on this, that everything needs to be bored under the lake. We do not want trenching anymore. So there's pipelines coming up for renewal. The life expectancy was 50 years. And those, most of them were renewed already in 2000 and, and more, you know, around that timeline, they came up. They're coming up again now. So they're already 25 years past their life expectancy, and they're asking for another 25 years. So you're talking something at the end of it, it's going to be 50 years past its life expectancy. And we're saying, no, the technology is there now. Build it correctly. That's the way the DAPL is. The DAPL's HDD board. You'd have to crack that 100 foot of soil to create a pathway for it to leak. So what it would do if there ever was a bizarre incident, it would follow the bore path out. And the way our terrain is, where it enters is higher. So the, if there was a leak, it'd actually flow away from the, the lake. It would flow into soil. So it, it's the safest means. And it's one of the things I love about my job because I don't work for the federal government. I don't work for the state. I've got a great relationship with the Corps of Engineers because they know I'm unbiased. I just want it built well, and then I'm approving of it. But I'm going to oppose anything that I don't feel is safe. So when we get out and there's pipeline groups that want to build, and I've dealt with five of them, there's a group called Michaels that's done the boring, and they've done exceptionally well. And they're a very good company to deal with. And uh, I can tell these groups that, I want your pipeline to be bigger so you have more space down the road if you need it. You have lower operating pressure. You're not redlining it. And I want it bored underneath. And I want you to use Michaels because we have an inherent trust with Michaels. We've seen the quality of their work over and over and over again, and it is A+. Plus. And the core would just sit back and smile because they can't say this stuff, you know, but I... I don't have skin in the game, really, so I can say what I want. I'm basically, you know, just somebody giving my perspective on what I feel would be the, the prudent way to develop. And, and almost every time they've gone with it. And so I've been really pleased that I not only get to protect our reservation, but I get to protect everything upstream because we're all in this together. I mean, it doesn't do me any good if there's a release up on the Willison side. That's still my lake. That's our lake. And so... Industry, for the most part, has been very, very good about that. The, the problem right now, and I'll get one, and once I get one, I'll get the others, is to get those obsolete old pipelines, when they come up for renewal, to be built correctly. You know, not the whole thing. So when you have a, produ or, um, a petroleum spill, that crude oil's got a lot of minerals in it, and once you get your hydrocarbons down below 100 ppm, these farmers and ranchers want this because it's enriched soil. You can see the, the, the crude spills because the vegetation is a plush, nice green versus produced water spills where you're killing that soil for generations. But you've, you've got to keep it on the land. If that goes in the water, it's the opposite spec perspective, you know. So we insist on that crossing being bored, and then we're not going to oppose it, you know. We, we, like I said, we welcome the safe transport. North Dakota needs it. We need it. But it's got to be done prudently. Go on the next one. Here goes training again. This is uh, one of the water training exercises. It was very realistic because we had a dead fish float to the surface when we did this. So it made it nice. But uh, just you got you to gotta practice. 
You got to go out there, do the routines. So you're not being overwhelmed when a real incident occurs. And, and it's always good that these groups are getting better and better at that. When I go out there and we have these drills, they learn about our water intake. So because of situations like this, we've modified their plans and said, if this happens in the summertime, we'll send a spotter out, look for an oil sheen on the water. If we see that occurrence, then we shut off our water intake. And so we don't you know, contaminate our water systems. So a lot of good comes out with trainings and you can't be complacent. You need to keep up on the trainings and add a little difficulty. You can't make your trainings too easy because an incident is never easy. Let's go ahead and go to the next one. So this is a, a different scenario. Um, we had erosion issues. So this is in the Badlands and it was a pinch point and it was a watershed area. So normally, you know, it looked okay, but it was bearing the weight of a transmission line from probably me to him. And when it was saturated, there was nothing underneath the pipeline. So it was operating as a bridge supporting six feet of soil. And we told them, you know, you have to fix this. But the group wouldn't listen to me. And I told FIMSA, I said, you have to make them fix this. And FIMSA is like, well, we can't do it unless they report it as a problem themselves. So it's a case of the, the fox guarding the hen house. You know, unless the fox says he has a problem eating too much chickens, he's not going to say nothing. But when I partnered with the core, we went together on this and they got on it and they've been great since then. So what used to be clay washed out a, a really difficult area, they've actually gone in multiple times. They put down meshing and different material and, ex, you know, excavation made it where it's a very safe area now. And that's what you got to do. Sometimes you can't give up because other groups aren't doing it. If you see an issue, you, you just got to keep pushing. You know, don't settle for no. We can go to the next one. Was that it? Uh oh, this is where I get into my rambling. Kill that teleprompter. <laughs> so another one of the issues we're having right now is, like I said, we changed out the fiberglass pipe. You know, that was predominantly produced water. We came up with a coated steel pipe requirement. This flex steel, this stuff is really, really durable. And it's helped us get to zero. And the other equivalent of it is a uh, shock core has a flex pipe, which is you know, like a cable woven inside or braided. It's like a braided cable inside of this. So you've got poly, you've got steel, and then you got the outer protection layer, no problems with this, no spills. Essentially nothing with this other than it was a faulty install. And, and that's hard of the problem with the Bakken is that when they put it in, the group installing it didn't meter it correctly and they cranked up, you know, thousands of pounds. Instead of saying, hey, why isn't it pulling through? They just, just kept cranking on it and they stretched it out and ruined the pipe. But that was just one small thing. It wasn't a big incident. What we're dealing with now, and this is kind of going to our uh, NDSU team, we have an issue with uh, poly pipe. They use this in natural gas collection. And one of the group has had, I, I can't even count, it's too many releases. And, and that's been another problem of mine is, you know, I'm not an engineer. Most of these groups have teams of engineers, but I'm the one who figures out their problem for them. And in this case, when we went to inspect it, I, I told them, I said, what's happening? Because they couldn't understand why they weren't having a problem in 2019, but going into 220 and 21, they were having all these releases. And it was determined that it was arcing through the pipe, it was building up standing static electricity and arcing. And I said, the reason being is in 2019, it was a tremendous Hydrology, hydrology year. We were having saturation everywhere, which was causing pipeline issues because the soil was so saturated, it would slide. And um, 2020 was like the driest year in 125 years. And so I explained to them what's going on is with no water saturation around the pipe, it's arcing through. Essentially, when there was enough water in the ground, it was, you know, it was, it was grounding it and preventing it. 
And so, you know, that's one of the groups we're dealing with now. And they always say the same thing. Oh, it only happens here. But you talk to the next group, they're having the problem. The next group, they're having the problem. But a lot of times it's not reportable because they look at natural gas as not being a meeting reportable, reportable quantity. But we have zero emissions. Our standards are 100% stays in the pipe. So we don't accept it. And that's one of the things we're trying to change essentially get everything to go to steel. We, we don't have problems with the trunk lines. All these groups that have these polys and fiberglass, their main line is made of steel. And, and we're just not having issues with that. I, I'm not supposed to talk about this, but I'm going to anyways. I don't care. You know, because they don't want to get into this. On the DAPL, I, and I said this with Governor Burgum, I sat on his pipeline improvement panel before. And I said, what we need is honest dialogue. And this is when it first started. DAPL had two barrels spilled, basically a gasket on above ground structure that was made for recovery. It was, it was clay lined. It was built for if something happened. And it was only two barrels. National news. That same weekend in Newtown, two trucks collided, you know, golfed in fire. Had that been later in the year, you know, during the drought, it could have easily, you know, done a lot of damage to the people there. Could have burned out a lot of homes. But it doesn't catch any news. You know, you're talking hundreds of barrels, you know, of oil-filled, you know, liquids, spilled blood, nobody says a word. But just the hype train, they go crazy over it. But when you look at, with pipelines, normally it's the first, they call it a pipeline bowl in the first five years is where you have incidents. Dapple, the, the, the total volume was less than one-tenth of a semi-truck, which we saw flip over all the time. But but they never talk about that. You know, they they basically run off of their trunk line. They've never had one gallon spill. You know, they've run the safest pipeline in the nation, taking five thousand trucks a day off the road, moving product from point A to point B. Our tribe focuses on the financials. I don't get into that, but the actual cost of that without that pipeline, you're talking nineteen you know dollars a barrel shock. So all your gasoline prices. The petroleum industry doesn't need an excuse to jack up the gas prices, but I guarantee you, if that pipeline goes down, you're going to be paying a lot of money at the pump. So there's got to be a happy medium. We, we've got to keep these guys in line where they're doing what they're supposed to do to the standards that we need them to. But there is a need for them. You can't overburden any portion of infrastructure. You can't overburden the roads. You can't overburden the, the rail system. You know, you need a happy medium and that can be attained as long as it's done prudently. And that's what we push for.